Well, I'm glad you could join us for the Midway Baptist Church of Athens, Alabama Adult Sunday School lesson. And it's our prayer that uh, you'll receive a blessing uh, from the lesson. We hope that you'll be able to join us since we're having live Sunday school each Sunday morning in our admin building, 10 a.m. And uh, we hope that you'll join us there. But if that's not possible, uh, we continue to record these lessons and place them on YouTube so that they're available at 10 a.m. each Sunday morning as well. And then our worship services live again at 11 a.m. in our sanctuary. And we hope that you'll be able to join us for worship. If that's not possible, we uh, also are live streaming those worship services uh, on Facebook. And you can watch them there. And we're also recording those lessons, place them in those uh, worship services, placing them on YouTube so that you can watch that. We hope that you'll worship with us in one of those venues. And then don't forget, each Wednesday night, Doc Overholt continues to lead us in an in-depth uh, Bible study of, uh, of Ephesians. And uh, we hope that you'll join us for that 6 p.m. each Wednesday night in our admin building. Uh, if you can't join us live, those are also live streamed and also recorded and placed on YouTube for you to watch. Uh, let's open with prayer. Father, I thank you for uh, this time that you've given us to read your word, Father, and to study it. And I pray, Father, that you'll help us, that we'll learn what you would have us to learn through the Holy Spirit uh, about uh, your word, Father, and how it applies to our lives. I pray, Father, for our church, Father, that you'll bless it, Father, that you'll uh, bless our pastor, Father, that you'll bless our time together as we study your word, and, uh, Father, that it'll be a blessing to us as well. I uh, pray, Father, that you'll just guide our thoughts, guide our words, and that above all, Father, you'll be honored, glorified, and magnified uh, by everything that we do and everything that we say, and it will be pleasing to you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Well, the title of our lesson today is God Honors, and uh, we're in uh, 2 Kings chapter 12. We'll be looking at verses 4 through 16, and... Uh, as we begin, uh, one of the questions I'd ask if this was a live session to, is how many of you use to-do lists to keep up with the tasks that you need to complete each day? Uh, and as I thought about myself, I don't have to-do lists uh, as much as I did when I was still in the workplace. Since I've been retired, I don't use them. I do use them occasionally, but not unless I have several uh, different important things going on and I'm trying to ensure that I don't drop the ball on any of them uh, but special occasions I do that when I need to prepare I do that uh, and you need to decide whenever you do those to-do lists you need to uh, prioritize them what, what's important what's most important what's least important and uh, you know we might look at emergency situations or uh, situations that require our immediate attention would be our first priority. Uh, needs of the family, bills, important tasks, appointments, we can put all those things. But above all, we need to prioritize uh, our time uh, with God, our time that we spend in studying his word, our time that we spend in prayer. Those need to be priorities as well. So when you think about your criteria for establishing those priorities, uh, we, we need to understand that whatever, however we establish our priorities, we do that based upon what's important to us. Uh, today's session helps us to better understand that God honors people who demonstrate uh, that their priorities, uh, that he is highest on our list of priorities, and uh, that our priorities really reflect what's important to us. So as we review the content, we're shifting today from the northern kingdom. In the past lessons, we've been talking about the northern kingdom of Israel and Elisha's uh, ministry, and prior to that, Elijah's ministry as well uh, as prophets in the northern kingdom. Today, we're shifting our context to the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah. And uh, although the timeline still places us uh, during Elisha's prophecy time, or time as a prophet, which spanned from about 850 B.C. to about 798 B.C., um, we are primarily going to be looking at uh, the rule of King Joash or Jehoash, depending on the Hebrew pronunciation, 
who ruled Judah from about 835 BC until 796 BC. So coinciding pretty closely with uh, at least a portion of Elisha's time as a prophet. Uh, as we read more specifically in verse 6 of our focal passage, it was in the 23rd year of Joash's reign that we're going to focus on, or about the year 813 BC. So we'll be looking almost specifically at about that time, 813 BC. King Joash uh, faced some monumental challenges from the time of his birth until he became king. Uh, as we look at this, and it's kind of confusing because we're dealing with both the northern and southern kingdom, but Jehu, who was king of Israel, killed Ahaziah. Ahaziah was the king of Judah. Ahaziah was married to Athaliah, and Athaliah was Ahab and Jezebel's daughter. So this is the southern kingdom. Athaliah is the, is the wife of the king Ahaziah. And Ahaziah has been killed by the king of, of the northern kingdom of Israel, uh, Jehu. So she was Ahab and Jezebel's daughter. And uh, she had all, her, all the heirs to the throne killed except for Joash. And Joash was a year old. Uh, and these, the ones that she had killed, the heirs to the throne, the princes of that kingdom, uh, she had all of them killed. And they were actually her grandsons, her grandsons. So she had all the heirs to the throne killed except for Joash. Uh, who was a year old. Joash was hidden by his aunt, who was the wife of Jehoiada, uh, the priest who anointed him king at the age of seven and had Athaliah executed. So it, so he was hidden from the time that he was a year old until he was seven. At that time, he was anointed king and we, and Jehoiada uh, had, uh, uh, had uh, Athaliah executed at that time. Our lesson passage is uh, begin then in the 23rd year of uh, Joash's reign. In our study, we're going to see how Joash assigned tasks and made it a priority to complete repair work that needed to be done on the temple, which was, uh, some commentaries say, uh, it was 125 to 150 years old. This would have been Solomon's temple. So we're going to begin uh, by reading Second Kings chapter 12, and we'll be looking at verses uh, four through eight. And Joash said to the priests, all the money of the dedicated gifts that are brought into the house of the Lord, each man's census money, each man's assessment money, and all the money that a man purposes in his heart to bring into the house of the Lord, let the priests take it themselves, each from his constituency, and let them repair the damages of the temple wherever the, any dilapidation is found. Now it was so uh, by the 23rd year of King Joash, that the priests had not repaired the damages of the temple. So King Joash, uh, Jehoash, uh, called Jehoiada, the priest, and the other priests, and said to them, Why have you not repaired the damages of the temple? Now therefore do not take more money from your constituency, but deliver it for repairing the damages of the temple. And the priests agreed that they would neither receive more money from the people, nor repair the damages of the temple. So we find here that uh, Joash's initial plan to repair the temple, it included uh, the collection of an annual uh, <coughs> offering that was done by each male, uh, the age of 20 or over, uh, and it was a half a shekel, basically a half a shekel per year, which in our uh, money today would have been about 4 to $5 dollars per man who was over the age of 20, and that was brought in to the temple. The gifts, in addition to that, uh, that were brought to the temple as a result of vows that had been made by uh, Israelites who had vowed uh, various types of vows, but they, as they made a vow, they typically gave an offering uh, to the Lord. And then the others were just voluntary gifts, uh, love offerings, we might say, but they were they were not required by the law, but they were voluntary uh, by the people who gave them. These funds were to be collected by the priests and those who were designated to help collect it. So they, 
it talked about the constituency of each of those priests. So they actually had people who assisted them in going out and collecting some of these offerings. Uh, the assessor or the acquaintance, as it's listed in uh, the King James Version, was to de determine the value of the silver given. And that, that needed to be done because at that time there was no uh, coinage in the southern kingdom or the northern kingdom for that matter. There were not coins. There were just pieces of silver, but they were not uh, of specific value. So the value had to be determined by taking the silver and weighing it and and basing the value of it on the weight of that silver and the, and the quality of the silver. So there was no standard coinage at that point. So what were the strengths of the plan that Joash gave? Well, it, obviously it was organized. He had told the priests that they were to go out and collect these offerings, and that as a result of that, that, that was to be applied uh, to the refurbishing or the repairing of the temple, which had become dilapidated over this 125 to 150 years. And what were the potential problems? Uh, the potential problem was, and we're going to see this uh, later in Scripture, was that there was no accountability to show that these funds uh, were used to repair the temple. In fact, the repairs had not been done, and, uh, and no one was accountable for that. The temple had not had the work done that was supposed to be done. So what did Joash decree? Well, he said the priests were not to collect any more money from the people the priests were relieved of their responsibility, kind of like a, a military officer being relieved of their command because they failed to accomplish what they were supposed to accomplish. They were relieved of their responsibility to get the repairs to the temple done. So when we think about this, what factors influence whether we confront someone who's not lived up to expectations? And, and Again, there you know the answers are not in uh, the instructor or the teacher's book or uh, uh, any of the books, but uh, the factors that influence whether we confront someone. In my mind, w first of all, whether or not they were doing the best that they knew how to do, that they were doing the best that that could be expected of the person that's doing it. If they fail to accomplish what needs to be accomplished, and yet they're doing their best, uh, then then I don't know how you would confront them and tell them to improve, not if they're doing their absolute best. Uh, you confront them based upon whether or not they were irresponsible. If they have been irresponsible in, uh, in not accomplishing uh, what needed to be accomplished, then certainly a confrontation is warranted. Uh, if there's some sort of dishonesty involved in the handling of the funds or in the handling of uh, resources, then there needs to be a confrontation. So Joash formulated a new plan for getting the work done, and uh, Jehoiada uh, and the other priests supported this plan. Listen for the new plan as we read our next passage. We're going to look at 2 Kings 12, uh, verses 9 through 12. Then Jehoiada, the priest, took a chest bored a hole in its lid and set it beside the altar on the right side as one comes into the house of the Lord. And the priests who kept the door put there all the money brought into the house of the Lord. So it was whenever they saw that there was much money in the chest that the king's scribe and the high priest came up and put it in bags and counted the money that was found in the house of the Lord. Then they gave the money which had been apportioned into the hands of those who did the work, who had the oversight of the house of the Lord. And they paid it out to the carpenters and builders who worked on the house of the Lord, and to masons and stone cutters, and for buying timber and hewn, hewn stone to repair the damage of the house of the Lord, and for all that was paid out to repair the temple. So what was the new plan? Well. The new plan was that, uh, that a box was made. And uh, Joash had this box made and had a whole board in the top of it, and it was placed on the right side of the altar. And just, you know, a year, uh, weeks ago as we studied the tabernacle and as we look at the floor plan of Solomon's temple, we find that the altar is near the entrance into the common area of the temple not in the, the holy area or the holy of holies. This was the area where all the people who 
came into the temple would come to if they were making a sacrifice they would be able to go in here they uh, if they were going into the holy place of the holy of holies only priests could do that uh, but this was in a place where all the people who came into the temple could access this box it was on the right side of the altar so how did Joash create a situation for accountability uh, for the offering and how was it to be used uh, the priests put all the offerings into the box that, that the people brought into the temple. They didn't keep any of that out of the box for any other purpose. It was all put inside the box. When the box got nearly full, uh, the high priest and the king's scribe, it's mentioned the king's scribe, or in some translations, uh, secretary. You might, might also have thought of this person as being an accountant when they were told the box was nearly full. They came, they took the contents of that box, they put it into bags, and uh, then it says they counted it. Well, again, once again, there was, no, uh, there was no standard coinage in that day, and so the value of the offerings, uh, people were putting uh, pieces of silver in there that, that may have been melted into some sort of shape, but it may have been, uh, may have been fairly raw. Some of it may have had impurities in it. But based on uh, the quality of the silver and the uh, and the weight of that silver, they uh, valued what it was. And once they had done that, then they would pay the craftsmen who were doing the work on the temple. They also paid uh, for uh, any materials that had been uh, needed for the work that was done on the temple from that offering. So there was a check and a balance that was put in place. Uh, that would enhance the accountability of those involved and uh, would create an atmosphere of honesty in all that they were doing for, for everyone to see. Everyone could uh, see that this was being done in an honest way. Neither the members of the royal court nor the religious leaders could accuse each other of mishandling the funds because there was one person from the royal court involved, this scribe or accountant was involved from the royal court and the, and the high priest was involved from the religious side as well. Because this box uh, became full, uh, uh, we're led to understand that the people were very generous as they saw this work being accomplished. Second Chronicles 24.10 says, uh, and that's more detailed than what we find in Second Kings, it says, and all the leaders and all the people rejoiced and brought in and cast into the chest until they made an end, or in other words, until it was full. The people gave joyfully and in abundance. So the people's generosity was an indication of two things. First, the temple, its upkeep, its renovation, and the proper worship of God had become a high priority in their lives. Otherwise, there would not have been this generosity uh, that they give because it was not a a legal uh, offering it was it was much of it was done in a voluntary way second Joash's solution uh, worked it was a proper solution so as we read our last passage look for how the money would be used we're going to look at uh, 2nd Kings 12 verses 13 through 16 however there were not made for the house of the Lord basins of silver trimmers sprinkling bowls, trumpets, any articles of gold or articles of silver from the money brought into the house of the Lord. But they gave that to the workmen and they repaired the house of the Lord with it. Moreover, they did not require an account from the men into whose hand they delivered the money to be paid to workmen, for they dealt faithfully. The money from the trespass offerings and the money from the sin offerings was not brought into the house of the Lord. It belonged to to the priests so the money was paid directly to the workmen who did the work or paid to those who had supplied the, the materials that were needed to repair the temple they were not required to give an account of their work it says because they were men of integrity uh, whether they were providing materials or whether they were actually doing the the work none of the money was used for utensils at, at this time until all the repair work on the temple was done. And in Second Chronicles 20.14, we see uh, there, if you were to go to Second Chronicles 24.14, you would see that it tells us that once 
all the repairs were made to the temple, then some of the utensils that were needed for the worship of God uh, were made using that money. So the money received for the trespass and sin offerings, we're told, was not used for repairs because this belonged to the priests. And again, you know, when we think about the tribes uh, of Israel, uh, the, the tribe of Levi was not given any uh, any land. The tribe uh, was they were they were made uh, priests. They were taking care of the of the temple there. That was their responsibility. But they they lived on what was given by the other uh, other tribes uh, of Israel. That was their the way that they were sustained in their living. So. Uh, it, this occasion reminds us that handling our money, both as an individual and as a church, bears witness uh, of our Christian faith. The Lord is honored as we honor him with our resources. And in turn, God honors that type of integrity if we give to the Lord in the way that he wants us to. Second Corinthians 9, 7 states, God loves a cheerful giver. Chuck Swindoll, I've heard him many times on the radio say God not loves a cheerful giver, but God loves a hilarious giver, uh, that we're to do this in a cheerful way. And we're to be a people who take joy in giving. We're to rejoice as we give to the Lord. So how might a church bring honor or shame to the name of Christ through the way that it handles its money or oversees its budget? Well, I think it's positive for if we use the money that people give for God's purposes and that it's done with integrity uh, and that it's accounted for in an appropriate way. It can be negative if uh, obviously if it's used uh, to uh, for affluent living on the part of uh, the staff uh, of that organization. We may think of some televangelists living high on the hog, as Jerry Clowers might say. Um, and I wanted to share with you something from the Vines Expository Bible uh, called Called to Service is the name of this little article. But I thought it was appropriate to share with you. It's not exactly along the lines of the lesson, but I think it's important. You would do well to study the Bible accounts of how people were called into the service of the Lord. Josiah was very young, seven years old, when he became king. This after having been saved as just a one-year-old from the murderous Athaliah who rose to power after her son died and destroyed all the royal heirs. But notice God's hand. One child was hidden in the temple for six years until the queen was slain and the rightful heir could take the throne. Surely during those young, year, young years, uh, those in charge of him guided him in learning to worship Israel's one true God. This had a huge impact on his early life. Very often I talk to young men or women who say they feel God has called them in some special way. Very frequently they will ask how God called me. I try to share with them my call. But what has been so interesting and notable to me through the years is that God calls in many ways. No two seem to be the same. There is no predictable pattern. At times God calls through circumstances. Often God uses people to call someone into God's work. Sometimes God just builds a great desire and interest in a person's heart to do a particular ministry. But seldom does God call someone who is doing nothing. God doesn't waste time trying to steer a parked car. Jehosheba was powerless against the queen, but she worked with the young future king to train and guide him so he would be ready when the time came. And young King Joash seems to have listened and learned well. Make sure you are busy doing what is before you, the duties that are at hand, and trust that God will call you and guide your next step. I thought that was very appropriate. So we need to remember that leaders are to be accountable for their actions, that God expects people to take care of their financial obligations, and that a believer's integrity in business can further the case uh, of God's kingdom and glorify him. Let's close with prayer. Father, I thank you for this lesson, Father, and for the scripture we've read. And 
for what it means to us. And I pray, Father, that you'd help us, that we might always be cheerful givers, that we might honor and glorify you in everything that we do, and that we would answer the call that you give us to serve you, Father. I pray for our church. pray that you'll help us, that we'll be salt and light in this community. Uh, pray, Father, for our pastors. He brings the message you've given to him for us. That, Father, we'll uh, take to heart uh, the message that we've been given. And that we'll be doers of your word, not hearers only. I pray, Father, that uh, you'll be with all those on our prayer list, regardless of what their problems are. We know that you're aware of every problem, Father. We just pray that according to your will that you would care for each one in a way that uh, you know is best for them. We pray, Father, for our nation and for our leaders, that you'll help our nation, that we might turn toward you instead of turning away from you, Father, and that we'll humble ourselves and seek your face and pray. And Father, we pray for healing for our land. We just pray, Father, that you'll guide us, that you'll direct us, that you'll forgive us where we've fallen short of uh, your will for our lives. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us today, and uh, until we meet again, may the good Lord bless and keep you.